I'm uh, Michael Bailey, Mike, um, and I'm the chassis vehicle system engineer for the Corvette program. Well, Mike, overall, what sort of suspension changes have you made on the C7 compared with the C6? Um, basically, we, we we know we had a uh, relative winner with the, with the way the C6 was set up from a, from a geometry standpoint. We did uh, widen the track with uh, front and rear um, by about an inch, and um, uh, but from a front suspension geometry standpoint, the car is uh, very similar to the C6. Uh, we did uh, in basically tried to take weight out of the suspension as much as we could. We knew there was some opportunity, uh, first of all, in the front cradle, uh, which we attach our, our lower control arm to. We went from a solid aluminum cradle um, to a hollow aluminum cradle and uh, that we saved a significant amount of mass there as well as uh, increasing the stiffness of the cradle. And then we moved out uh, to the lower control arms and took um, a solid uh, aluminum lower control arm and we went to a hollow cast aluminum control arm and uh, saved about four kilograms of, of mass uh, front and rear by just going uh, to hollow control arms. And then we um, we actually have uh, three different suspension levels on the car. There's a FE1 suspension, which is the base car suspension. Um, it's got 35 millimeter uh, Bilstein uh, shocks, uh, about a 26.7 millimeter front hollow stabilizer bar, and no rear stabilizer bar. We were actually able to tune that out, so that saves some mass on the base car. And then once you get to the Z51 package, um, we went uh, the, the FE3 package, which is the the uh, the passive shock Z51. It's got 45 millimeter uh, Bilstein shocks on it, um, with a 28 millimeter front bar and a 26 millimeter rear bar. And then the the MR equipped Z51 um, is the FE4 package, and that's got a 28 millimeter front bar and a, a 31 millimeter rear bar, and that's got the Gen 3 uh, MR system in it, which is the twin wire dual coil. Uh, technology so you're able to uh, ramp in your damping and, and get the damping out of the shock a lot uh, quicker about 40 percent faster than you did with the previous generation MR shock which is on the C6. And MR means the adjustable suspension that uses the magneto rheological fluid is yeah, that right? That's correct. Okay yeah. when you mentioned the track width did you achieve the greater track width by uh, using a wider cradle or a longer control arm? We used it by moving the points outboard so the, the uh, lower control arm attachment points went outboard. Do you still have the uh, transverse uh, composite uh, springs? Yes, yep, still have those. And, and really, um, I know there's a lot of folks that, um, that uh, go to the track that switch over to coilovers. Um, from our, our point of view, uh, the architecture of the car uh, it allows you to, uh, to have a low hood line with this. We're able to get um, uh, a lot of, basically, it's a lower CG uh, than a coilover shock would be. It's actually overall lighter than a coilover shock would be when you add on the, the, uh, all the bracketry you need on a coilover shock to, to have the coil sit on the shock. And we've, we've really built up a lot of history on the previous programs for how to tune, uh, tune the cars to meet all the, uh, the different suspension levels. And we've got the rates um, pretty much ironed out as far as what, what vehicle needs what rate spring. And, and we've applied all that knowledge to the C7. So, uh, and the, the uh, customer still has the ability to trim the car differently if he wants to by adjusting the tip height adjusters that are on the ends of the spring. So, how much adjustment is available on ride height there? Um, you can get, you can, depending on where the, the tip height adjuster comes from uh, when the car is shipped, because we also do a little bit of fine tuning ourselves, but you can, you can probably get about uh, 25 millimeters of, of adjustment. Um, uh, so, you know, that, that, that's a, it's, it's about an inch worth of adjustment out of the suspension to, uh, to play with. One criticism on the C6 is that uh, it seems that just cruising down the highway, mm -hmm. it doesn't have much damping on really small motions. There's just a, a bit of float in the car yep. in the way that a Porsche doesn't. Is that by design? Is that something your customers want? Or um, is that an artifact of the transverse uh, spring that has very little internal damping? I don't think it's that. I mean, I, I think the spring itself has the same uh, dynamic properties for the most part that a coil spring would. 
Um, I mean, some of that might be, uh, we've got relatively low ride frequencies, um, and, uh, but I think we may improve some of that with, on the C7, by we've, we've actually now gone to a, a, a dual path shock mount, which allows us to, um, the shock rod is now isolated in its path uh, versus the shock body. So the shock rod has its own rate uh, when it's attached to the body, and there's a, a rubber attachment there, and, now, and the shock body um, is tuned into uh, where it impacts the structure. is It's got its own path as well, and they're independent. Well, what's the difference between the shock mount and the shock body? What am I missing here? I the mean, one of end the, of the shock absorber goes to the suspension, and the other goes to the body somewhere. Which I'm, one is I'm which? I'm talking on the, on the upper end of the shock, so you've got the rod that actually attaches to um, an aluminum, now attaches to an aluminum um, uh, bracket that's attached to the side of the car. The shock body, the top of the shock body, which moves with the unsprung mass, eventually is going to impact the jounce bumper on a, on a significant ride event like a pothole or something like that. Um, and that, that path is now isolated, where it hits that uh, jounce bumper is now isolated from the rubber that the shock rod mounts to. So previously, we had to really tune that, that shock rod rate to account for the uh, jounce bumper being in series with it. Now they're in parallel, so they're, they're not affecting each other. So there's not a compromise there there's in the way you tune those two so, things. So there should, the, the car should uh, you know, offer a better, just a, a better ride, a uh, smoother ride, um, because we're isolating those two, uh, uh, those two functions of the shock absorber. Are there any new suspension components or technologies in the C7? Um, the, the hollow casting control arms are new, um, and again, that's a, that's a stiffness increase and a, and a mass increase, or mass decrease. Um, and the MR shock, the, the, new, the new gen technology MR shocks, those are probably the biggest, are probably the biggest ones. And what about this uh, electronic limited slip differential? What is that and what does it do for you? Um, it's, it's, first of all, it's, a, it's a standard on the Z51 package and it allows the, um, all the, the systems of the car, so the, the, steering wheel, uh, the st steering wheel angle, the brake pedal, the accelerator pedal uh, position, um, the transmission position, all those get fed into an uh, algorithm and that's sent to a controller, a chassis control module, which feeds information to the actuator for the limited slip differ differential. And that allows you to um, basically send power, send the right amount of power to uh, the road wheels. Um, so if you're going into a turn uh, and you, you basically want an open diff so that the car will react quickly and that the inner tire will rotate at the right speed uh, at a, a slower rate than the outer tire will. Uh, so, so that helps you get be nimble going into the corner. Um, if the car uh, starts to see uh, some instability, uh, it, it, uh, the algorithm is set up such that it'll start to send power to that inner tire and it'll actually help a little bit in understeer to keep the car stable uh, as approaching the corner and kind of in the corner. And while coming out of the corner, if the driver applies some throttle, uh, it'll actually help control his throttle oversteer condition to keep the car going straight. And uh, what we've noticed um, just in the slalom is it's a lot easier to drive a car fast through the slalom. Um, it just, it's a lot smoother. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a lot easier to learn how to drive the car through the slalom than it was on the previous generation. Some companies have what they call an electronic limited slip differential, and they're basically just using the ABS actuators to modify the rear calipers, to, which avoids wheel spin, but that's not what you're doing, is no, it? No, this is actually a clutch that's um, mounted in the differential, mounted to the differential, that's got a separate hydraulic circuit. Um, it operates, um, basically, its actuation is through a separate hydraulic circuit that's got a, a pump um, that, that sends fluid to that, uh, to some pistons inside of this um, uh, casting that's attached to the uh, differential. And it actually uh, actuates this clutch mechanism which um, connects the, the uh, uh, driven part of the axle to the half shaft. So it'll connect and disconnect and modulate that amount of torque to the, to the half so, shaft. So it's essentially a, a mechanical limited slip differential, except the degree of slip is infinitely variable. Yes, yes, yep. 
Okay. Uh, are there any brake changes on the C7 compared with the C6? Yep. It's um, it's basically uh, we've gone from the uh, on the base car previously we had uh, um, sliding calipers as 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 uh, standard equipment on the base and the and the and the old Z51. Uh, we've gone to fixed calipers front and rear now. Um, Brembo supplies uh, all, all of our brakes at this point, um, and they're uh, about 12 and a half inch rotors uh, on the front of the base car. We go to 13 and a half, no, uh, 13 and a half inch rotors on the front of the Z51. Um, we've got bigger uh, uh, calipers on, on the front as well on the Z51, um, and uh, we've we've basically increased uh, the surface area of our uh, brakes by. Um, about 35% on the uh, on the base car, and about 30% on the Z51, uh, and then you can even comparing to the old to the previous generation, the C6 Z06, where we actually got more surface area than the the uh, Z06 does on the Z, for the new with the new Z51. Well, the old base car with the sliding calipers, it's kind of a simple technology, but the car, it was very effective. It was. So is this new change to give you more fade resistance or to give you a really flashier looking caliper in the front wheel? Uh, it helps with the looks, obviously, um, but it does help with fade. It helps with more even brake pad wear. Uh, it helps with rolling resistance. Um, should have less rolling resistance with a fixed caliper. So, um, so yeah, that, that's, those are, and, and, and obviously, uh, we've we've also improved our brake system really with our tires as well <coughs> by going to the uh, Michelin tires that there's a lot of technology that um, was learned from doing the the uh, ZR1 tire with uh, the Michelin engineers and, and Jim Merrill and our development engineers at Milford and then they developed the cup tire for the old C6 and uh, when uh, Michelin won the business for the C7 program after a tire shootout, uh, those same group of engineers got with our group of engineers and they started to develop the base tire for the C6 and the Z51 tire. And uh, those t two tires share some of the same characteristics, but the, the Z51 tires definitely tune more for the track. It's got some racing compounds in it that are similar to the, the slick tire that Michelin uses um, for their racing programs. And the base tire's got some additional uh, uh, characteristics that are good for uh, ride performance, uh, for wet, wet and dry handling. It's still a summer tire, but uh, it's a little bit more of a uh, daily driver kind of tire than the Z51 is. Well, that brings up the question about run flats. Uh, the last couple of generation of Corvettes have had run flat tires. I assume the C7 does too. And run flats get a little bit of criticism for uh, harsh ride and high noise level. Do you think right. you've made any progress in that area? I, I think so. I mean, the, the tire technology has come a long way since, since we did the tires on the, on the uh, 2005 C6. Um, and, you know, Michelin uh, has, they definitely have, have uh, put a lot of effort in the, into trying to get the, uh, when you tell them that you're interested in getting good ride performance, they've got the technology in order to do that. So, um, there, like I said, the, the ride performance on the uh, base tire, I mean, it's, we, we really tuned it for, it still has to have some track capability, but we want it to have good ride performance. It is still a run flat, so it's still going to have, still not going to be a, you know, a 1978 uh, uh, super tall sidewall tire that you'd get on a, you know, a Pontiac Brome or something, right? It's still going to have some stiffness to it, but uh, it's, it's, um, you know, and, and we also were looking at rolling resistance as well. We wanted to have, have the rolling, rolling resistance low, uh, but you can still get a good sticky tire. Michelin's got ways to get a, still a good sticky tire with good rolling resistance. So uh, they, those, they understood those, both of those things were important to us. Any change to the steering system of the C7? Yep, we uh, made a pretty big change. We went from hydraulic power steering to electric power steering. And uh, we understand there's, uh, um, so been a lot of criticism of uh, vehicles going to EPS because you lose steering feel, and we're very conscious of that. It was a, it was a um, big debate when we made the change whether that was the right thing to do or not. Um, but now that we've done it, I just I actually was just in a in a C7 uh, a prototype with Jim Merrill uh, about a week ago, and I asked him. I said, "So what do you think?" He's like, "The steering system is awesome. It's way better than the C7." And he was one of the guys that really was saying he wasn't real sure about it. 
uh, and we uh, we went to um, it's a belt drive EPS. It's got. Uh, um, is this the ZF system? It is a ZF system. It's uh, similar to one of our major competitors, their system. And uh, but we uh, we've I think we've learned some some things uh, as well on the fact that we've got a uh, it's got a, a ball nut and worm gear drive. So it's basically an electric motor hooked to a belt drive that's hooked to a ball nut that drives the worm gear, which is on the same which is on the steering rack itself. And uh, it's low friction, and there's a lot of there's a lot of pitch to the worm gear, which means that you get a lot of which uh, on certain cars you wouldn't want that, but on a Corvette you want a lot of road feedback, and that that allows the mechanical advantage of the road of, for the road to give feedback to the driver that that correct amount of pitch, and the fact that it's such a low friction uh, joint with being a, a ball screw mechanism, so. Um, we've been pretty happy, and it's a variable rack as well, and it's got, we've got a slightly uh, quicker steering ratio than we did on the C6, so. Um, well, if that competitor is the 911, I've driven that car, and it's got to be one of the best electric power steering systems I've experienced, okay. so well, sounds like you're on the right track I, with that one. I think we've, like I said, we've been pretty happy with, with, with the results we've had. We're still not done, and, and then another benefit of the EPS is the fact that you can get uh, significantly different tunings for each variant of the car and then there's different modes so the FE1 car the base car can get a steering uh, uh, setup or a steering tune for the touring mode and then for the sport mode and then the track mode and that can be significantly different and those tunings are different than the FE3 Z51 which are different than the FE4 Z51 so it gives a lot of free reign to Jim to, to get the steering system exactly right for the for the car he's tuning. It's not strictly a suspension item, but I was looking at the muffler over there, yep. and I noticed uh, a lot of valving on the muffler. I remember you had an adjustable sound muffler before, but this one seems to have an additional valve. What's going right. on with these new C7 mufflers? Yep, that's our AFM valve. Um, a and AFM is what? It's active fuel management. And what so does that mean? Basically, uh, we're going from eight cylinders to four cylinders to uh, save, save fuel. Uh, when when the additional power is not needed, um, so but when you do that, you get some NNV. Um, you basically you tune your exhaust system to your engine, and you tune an exhaust system. When you tune an exhaust system for a V8, it doesn't necessarily work real good when you've only got four cylinders uh, that are that are in combustion. So um, this AFM valve actually will close um, to a certain extent. Uh, the one, and this is the, the valve that's prior to the muffler, um, and that's on all, all the C7s, is that, that valve. That will close in four-cylinder mode, and it actually, and I don't know all the physics behind it, because I'm, I'm not an exhaust engineer, but uh, that does uh, significantly reduce the NNV, uh, negative effects of NNV due to four-cylinder mode. Once you get to V8 mode and you, you, you want some power, that valve opens, and then on the systems that have the, uh, the uh, enhanced uh, sound or the, the what I call the NPP system, that's the RPO for the, for the uh, valve. That's the that's adjustable muffler system. Adjust, adjustable muffler system, that opens up. And, and that's uh, on one of the tailpipes. Right, that's on one of the tailpipes and that basically opens up a more straighter flow through the muffler. So um, I talked to our exhaust engineer uh, and, and I asked him for a restriction uh, improvements and if you compare the base system from the C6 to the base system from the C7 you get about a 13 percent reduction in restriction and then the NPP system the the one with the with four valves is actually about 26 to 27 percent more efficient more uh, less restrictive so o uh, over the NPP C6 over the old, over the old NPP C6 is it louder also uh, you know I'm not sure I haven't seen the data on that but it sounds awesome I mean we definitely, uh, you know, we had the same, again, we had the same exhaust lead engineer working on that, that and we had uh, a lot of the same NNB guys uh, tuning the, the exhaust system out at, out at uh, Proving Grounds. So, uh, you know, they've, I think they're, they've gotten it to the point where it sounds great. My name is Jordan Lee. I'm the chief engineer and program manager for the small block engine family. Tell me, Jordan, what engine are we going to see under the hood of the C7? Uh, the engine under the C7 is our all-new Pride and Joy. It's our fifth-generation small block for Corvette, and it's uh, the LT1, an RPO. Very historical for us that we resurrected for this fifth-generation 
going into this new Corvette. LT1 was a high-performance small block from what, 69 or 70? In the 70s, and then yeah. it made another resurgence again uh, as a gen, uh, I forget the generation, gen two, I believe it was. Um, but we think now it's in its best configuration ever in the Gen 5. So we call this a small block, but it's upgraded from the previous one. What makes this LT1 different than the last small block? Well, the fourth generation, or Gen 4 as we call them, internally we have our uh, Gen 4. Gen 3 was major for small block. Gen 4 we added AFM. Uh, we also introduced... What's AFM? Uh, active fuel management, also known as cylinder deactivation. We turn off four cylinders. Uh, but Gen 5 is, is an all-new uh, design for us. It's a total melt and re of the small block engine family. Um, it does maintain the same architecture, uh, which is a cam in the block, uh, which gives it a very high power density small package with lots of power. Uh, but it also has the same historical 4.4 inch bore spacing. And some people, a lot of the historians, equate that as being part of the small block lineage. Uh, but the fifth generation is so new that we have very few carryover parts. Uh, the carryover parts actually would fit in a lunch baggie. Uh, the two bolts that hold the starter on, uh, a valve spring retainer, the valve spring retainer keepers, piston pin and the circlips are the only carryover parts from the Gen 4. And for your readers, the Gen 4 was the LS3, which was the base engine in the Corvette. Uh, we also have the LS7 and the Z06 and the LS9 and the ZR1. So what, are, what would you say are the two or three key upgrades to the LT1? Uh, the major upgrade really is the direct injection fuel system and the combustion system. Uh, with all new engine designs, uh, at least in GM, and I think our competitors do the same thing, things start with a combustion system. Uh, you develop a very high performance, optimized combustion system. Direct injection was a big part of that for us, and then we grow the engine around that. Uh, so we did tremendous amount of analysis, uh, over six million hours of CPU time spent on developing that combustion system. Uh, where we got it to the point where we wanted it so we could extract literally every bit of energy out of the fuel, which is great for making power and torque, and a byproduct is also great for fuel economy, it improves fuel efficiency. So with the, the direct injection, we also added uh, AFM, cylinder deactivation, uh, cam phasing, which is a first for Corvette. We didn't have that in the LS3, even though we had variable valve timing in some of the truck variants and the Camaro variant. Um, and the final one uh, being um, AF, the AFM, the DI, uh, the CV, CVVT, or the continuous variable valve timing, and then finally we have a very sophisticated loop system. It's a two-step variable displacement oil pump. The, is, is the prime benefit of the direct injection power or fuel efficiency or both? Actually, it's both. Uh, what DI allowed us to do was raise the compression ratio. And compression ratio is one of those little magic features of an engine design that if you raise it, it allows you to get better power, torque, and fuel efficiency. Uh, in the past, when you wanted more performance, you usually suffered worse fuel economy. There was always that trade-off. Uh, but with a high compression ratio, if you can tolerate the high compression ratio, uh, you get all those three things uh, at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, so the DI is a big part of that because the DI keeps the combustion chamber cool. And by keeping the chamber cool, we're much less prone to detonation. Uh, and with high compression ratio engines, detonation is always the big evil. And if things start to detonate, the engine gets hot, you have to pull spark, you're not making as much power anymore. Uh, it's kind of a downward spiral. But with DI, spraying the fuel in the chamber, when it evaporates, it keeps that chamber very cool, keeps the piston cool. It allows us to maintain a high compression ratio and not suffer any detriments. So it's all very synergistic. Uh, the DI, the high compression ratio, really played off on each other well to get increased power, torque, you heard we're 450 horsepower, 450 foot-pounds of torque, which are our targets. Uh, we haven't certified the engine yet, so we, uh, we will certify it the first quarter of next year, SAE certification for power and torque. And we're very confident we're going to achieve those targets, and we're hoping there's a little bit more in the bag that uh, we may actually be able to exceed them a little bit. There have been previous GM engines that had the uh, variable displacement and also the continuously variable valve timing. Was there a challenge? implementing those technologies on a Corvette engine that revs higher than, say, a truck engine that might have used those technologies earlier? Not so much, uh, because the technologies, um, we, we learned a lot on the truck applications. Uh, it's a very sound technology, uh, but the fact that we have a valve train that's capable of high, high engine speed, uh, the AFM doesn't operate at high engine speeds. We usually only operate up to about 3,500 RPM, and above that RPM, we go into the V8 mode, so we don't have to worry about switching. 
So the key to longevity for that AFM system is to making sure that you're switching in and out of those different modes at an engine speed that can accommodate the mechanism and allow it the time to work. Did these uh, advanced new technologies add any uh, weight and bulk to the engine? No bulk. Uh, we were very proud of the fact that we were able to contain all that hardware within the same confines of the engine today. Uh, but they, there is always uh, additive mass when you add components. Uh, the high pressure fuel pump has to generate 2,000 PSI's with the pressure, so it's a pretty stout pump. Its structure, uh, its steel structure is made to withstand those pressures and that adds some mass. Likewise with the fuel system and the rail, it's capable of withstanding 2,000 PSI of rail pressure and the injectors. That, a cam phaser also that we, we've added to the, the Corvette engine also adds some mass. So the, the engine's mass did go up over the LS3, but we feel it's more than offset by the efficiency gains that we've got in making power and torque and also the fuel economy. That cylinder deactivation system, there's nothing that can touch the brake specific fuel consumption of that engine when it's in four cylinder mode. Um, the downsize boost at all the other technologies, when you look at it on a brake specific basis, when you're in, in uh, four cylinder mode, the engine's running unthrottled, it's running in an efficiency range that no other engines can, can touch. A lot of the foreign competitors to the Corvette have overhead cam, four valve engines. Do you think buyers, at least overseas, will accept a pushrod engine in, in 2014 in a modern sports car? I, I don't think they'll have any issues with it at all once they drive the car. Uh, everybody has preconceived notions of what makes a high-tech car, or high-performance car, or an engine, I should say. Uh, but the challenge for the engineer is to come up with a very small, power-dense package for a car like the Corvette. Uh, it's a very elegant, high-performance sports car. It's got a very low center of gravity, a very low hood line. And we did look at a lot of different technologies when we decided to do a fifth generation small block. And honestly, the double overhead cam was not off the table. We could do anything we wanted. We do a lot of double overhead cam engines in GM today, our V6s, as well as our four cylinder engines. So we, we know how to do those. Uh, but if we, we do that uh, on a small block engine for Corvette, the engine's bigger. It's heavier, and the hood gets taller, and the car center of gravity goes up, and it's not the car that we want it to be. So the challenge that Taj always gives us is he wants more power, more torque, and a smaller package. And we think the architecture that we have is unparalleled. There are very few competitors in the world today, I don't know any, that has the power density that we have. And power density is our term, and it means how much power does that engine make based on the size of the engine. And if you look at the small block LT1, it's extremely compact. It fits under the hood, a very low hood line at that of the Corvette. Uh, double over cam, twin turbocharged double over cam, it just, it just would not work. It would not fit. It would not make the car the car that we want it to be. What transmissions are you going to offer with the LT1? Well, the car will be introduced with the automatic transmission, uh, the six-speed that we have today. Uh, it's, it's been revised a bit to be matched in, uh, very favorably with the AFM system. Uh, and also a new seven-speed manual transmission that has one extra gear. Um, highway fuel efficiency uh, is going to be a very surprising fact for people who are customers who buy this car. Uh, when they're in four-cylinder mode in seventh gear cruising down the highway, uh, they're going to be in for a very big surprise when they see how much fuel economy they're actually getting on the DIC. Uh, were, were there any challenges in developing a seven-speed and fitting it into the package? That one I'm not really uh, able to answer. I, I'm the engine chief. Okay. I don't know a lot about the, the package okay. size of the transmission. Uh, but I would assume not because uh, eventually they did get it into the car. How about, uh, can you talk at all about whether you considered, did you consider using any twin clutch type of transmissions that are getting more and more popular these days? Mm, I don't know that one either. Maybe okay. A transmission question. Uh, did you face uh, challenges in the refinement of the engine when you're running with this very tall gearing in four cylinder mode and how do you overcome those? Well, when an engine runs in four cylinder mode, a V8, a v, a, the V8 engine, a 90 degree V8 engine uh, in four cylinder mode does have vibrations. I mean, uh, we know that for a fact because of our history with AFM. Uh, but we configure the engine and it's the firing order and the zone as we de deactivate to minimize that vibration. But the key is, not, is making sure that vibration does not get transmitted back into the vehicle where the passenger or the driver can actually feel it and have it become obnoxious. So with trucks, uh, it's a, an easier job because we have the ability to attenuate those vibrations with a lot of different mount architectures, hydraulic mounts, for example. Taj was able to do the same thing in the Corvette. The Corvette structure was actually designed to attenuate those vibrations to make it very transparent to the customer. 
Um, everybody's concerned about fuel economy, but we don't want our customers to, be, to sacrifice anything in noise and vibration and harshness. We want it to be seamlessly transparent, so we want him to have 450 horsepower under his right foot at, at his beck and call, and then when he's cruising down the highway, he should know he's in four-cylinder mode and our objective we think has been met with all the work that's been done to the Corvette. Uh, the, the mounts, uh, the actual active noise cancellation to attenuate any of the other odd noises that you could possibly hear. Uh, the car does have active noise cancellation? That would be something you'd have to talk to Taj. Okay. It's a technology that we actually use in Cadillac. Uh, we've used it in the Escalade for a while. We use it in the Equinox and a few other cars the too. Equinox. Yeah, that's yeah. True. Yeah. yeah, I'm familiar with that. Uh, but we're, you know, we're very happy. Like I said, you know, 45 kilograms, 99 pounds lighter. We have a few changes we might be able to slip in before production. Maybe we can get over that. We, now our goal is 100, right? Yeah. We got 99, we want to go to 100. But, um, and so it's 57% stiffer. And like Tad said, the interesting fact is if you compare the open vehicle of this car to the Z06 with the roof bolted in, it's 20% stiffer. Yeah, that's impressive. That's so very we're, impressive. We're, uh, very, uh, and, and I think Tad's went through the, um, you know, so that was the number one goal, lightweight and and it turned out to be, you know, stiffer for squeaking rattles, for riding and handling, et cetera, everything you do, stiffness. And like Tad had said, I think, you know, the two main areas we did it was, you know, it was convenient to have the, the hydroform rail. You didn't have to worry about the connections. It was a continuous rail. But the disadvantages are, of course, you know, it's one thickness, full length. And we really did struggle when we did the Z06 because up front wants to be a little bit softer for crash readiness to have a pulse ride down. And in the middle wanted to be stiffer for torsion. And we really had to balance it and we had to give up on some of the stiffness here. We decided to break it into the five segments, take the challenge of the connections, which is really the hard part, and then you know really be able to customize every every segment of the car for what it needs to do. You know, like the, the cast nodes, you know, very rigid backup structure for the front crush and uh, very precise, provides all the attachments, cradles, upper control arms and shock tower all in one attachment, all in one assembly. And uh, I, I hadn't had a chance to talk to you actually we do not, unlike the Z06, which we built, has a lot of MIG welding in it on main line, we have to machine when you're done. We have to machine the chassis interface points. The way this car was designed with our manufacturing brethren is we actually, um, we machined it at the source, which is DMI in Montague, Michigan. And then when we build the rails up, we build the rails and then the tunnel, when we go main line, we don't do any MIG welding. We do uh, bond and we do bonding with adhesive, crash stuff and adhesive. We do screws to hold the bond until it sets up through the Elpo oven. And then we do spot welding. But we really tried to stay away from MIG welding. So when we're looking at the front there where the, uh, uh, the cast section goes into right. the hydroform rail, how right. is that joined? Well, right that there? actually is MIG weld because that's done in a sub-assembly. Okay. So the whole rail is built. They actually in the plan, if you look, very automated. They build each rail. Left and right-hand rails have their, own, have their own substation. They build them up with the five pieces, put them in the tools. They MIG weld both front and back on either end, and then they carry them over to the main line. And, that's, and we actually check every rail for dimensional integrity before we ship it to the main line. And that's, but right there, that's done. we're done with the MIG welding. We do MIG welding in the subs, in the major subs, but once we get the main line, we want to take the MIG welding out of the equation. And that was really because we really, at the higher volume, we couldn't afford to machine every car. Well, you've made, the new structure is substantially lighter, it's substantially stiffer, how do you afford it? Because you look at the C6 and the aluminum structure is only on the high-end cars, yeah. the Z06 I, I and ZR1. Now you're at the base car. How do you do that? Well, definitely when you do, you know, you can always say, depending, it's all, you can always buy mass for, you know, innovative materials, right? And the one thing I think the big decision was to bring an inside bowling green. So when we bring this into the plant, it's almost, it's just, it's a pile of parts, I always say. It's really, there's very few sub-assemblies that come into that plant. Uh, the most sub-assemblies have small brackets on it, but the entire frame is welded in the bowling green in the new Bowling Green aluminum body shop. So then it really makes it much more affordable because you're going out and sourcing just a, a, a single extrusion or a single stamping or a single casting. You're not sourcing sub-assemblies. Have there been some breakthroughs in the uh, manufacturing of these uh, hollow cast assemblies that have brought their price down in the last few years? I, you know, to be honest, I'm not the expert. I mean... Because you have a whole bunch of them on this know. car. There's several major ones. I think they're, just the industry, is the supply base is building up. We had three bidders on the, on the, high, on the cast nodes, and, and that's a sand core, obviously. It's a sand core. It's, it's a low-pressure casting. We have a low-pressure casting at the hinge pillar. And then, of course, we got the more exotic high pressures inside the tunnel that you can't see. Now, those definitely are a little bit more expensive. Those are high-pressure, 
high vacuum so you pull the material into the mold very quickly so you don't get the porosity, you can get much thinner gauges, but you can't do that in a hollow section. So we kind of had to balance where we use the, you know, the cast nodes, which are hollow, versus the high pressure in the center of the tunnel. But we definitely, the supply base is increasing. And you know, I think there, there were more Europe supply, European suppliers, certainly for the high pressure die casting. Now they're coming to the US as more and more people look at lightweighting and aluminum. So really, when, when you get a supply base, you get competitive bidding, right? Yeah. You know, and I don't know techn technological breakthroughs that I know of, to be honest. Okay. The, uh, since the C6 was introduced, as nine years ago, there have been a lot of uh, new crash standards, some of them official, right. some of them the aftermarket kind of testing, right. like the offset crashes. How do those figure into your structural well, uh, considerations? That's actually interesting. We have, um, we actually have much more, that was part of the part about the 99 pounds. Actually, we could not re-engineer the Corvette structure, would not pass all the new regulations. Additional offset requirements, IHS requirements, internal standards, so we go through a battery of tests. I don't know, well over 20 high-speed tests, front, side, rear. Um, and actually, it's just, you know, we have analytical tools. We estimate where we have to, you know, where we have to put the metal in the structure, and then we do our analytical tools, and then we crash test. But I think the answer, I think it's just that, I don't, I don't know how much we could save if we went ahead the additional requirements. But it is a law, it is a fed, you know, it is regulations we have to pass now, so we engineer for it. And it's really hard to separate, you know, it's, it's durability, stiffness and crash readiness. And when we do our analytical models, when we do our design, we're kind of looking at all of them along with manufacturability all at once. So when you get done, you're kind of saying, okay, if we wouldn't have had that regulation, how much more we could have saved? It's almost, some, you know, we don't really know because we engineer it all, all together as one conglomerate. What does the new structure do to the performance of the uh, suspension and the steering? Uh, uh, have you made any progress with stiffness or other areas? Um, well, I think, um, you know, the steering stiffness has its own, and that's Mike. Um, for me, I think our main thing is the uh, chassis interface, the local stiffnesses. We also have, we have global stiffness and local stiffness for all the chassis attachments for ride and handling. And we had some additional, more aggressive targets from Jim Merrow and Mike Bailey on that. So we definitely improved the local stiffnesses. I don't actually have the percentages on those. But you're talking about the places where, say, the control arms attached yes, to attachment. the chassis. Yep. So you wanted those to be more rigid, less more deflection, rigid. Less everything deflection, more absolutely. precise. Because really, you got really the global compliance and local compliance. And you know, if it, it can be very stiff locally, but if it's giving locally at the interface, it's not going to be acceptable on the track to Jim Merrow. So really, they roll those down. And the way it really works, they roll those down and they say, hey, we need this stiffness at this interface point. And I can say, really, from a crash readiness, a global stiffness, and a local stiffness, all the requirements are more, more stringent than the C606. Well, I understand the overall the steering system is much stiffer and there's many components to that. But is the column mount uh, something that you've upgraded on Actually, this car? Actually, that's, that's a very interesting question. Actually, the column mount, because we have our tunnel structure, we, we really did not look to upgrade it. And actually, it's very similar to today's car because we have a very short span between our tunnel and our hinge pillar. We think we probably have some of the best stiffness in the industry as far as the column mount. So I think they were very happy with that interface point. Now, in the, uh, uh, the center tunnel structure, you move the uh, bolt-on panel that right. closes up the uh, tube right. from kind of two-thirds of the way right down, down all the way right to down. the bottom. Exactly. Why'd you do that? Um, as you know, well, First thing I always say about a convertible structure through the whole center compartment, that's where you have no torsion because you have no roof. So really, and that was the invention on C5, was always this, this ten, center tunnel structure that is well connected to the rest of the car. And we do that through the shear walls. For, but for the center tunnel section, it's all about torsional stiffness. And I always say, it can, it's got to get big, but it can't be like your furnace duct at your house, which has matchboxing. So it's kind of this balance. How big can it get? So we approach it two ways. First off, we had to move that plate below the exhaust. And then we had some real challenges thermally because now we got the exhaust trap next to the powertrain components. And if you, if you look at our close-up panel, we got holes in it, and that was very managed from both an aero, a thermal, and a structure perspective. And we used computer simulation to put the holes where they would help the thermal but not hurt the stiffness of the vehicle. But I, I, I'd have to give you the numbers, but we increased the stiffness, I'm sure, by 20 to 30% in the center tunnel section. And, um, and then we, we reinforced each corner, because like I said about the furnace duct analogy, where it's a very big section, but it doesn't have any torsional stiffness, because it will match box if you twist it. So then we put reinforcements in each of the four corners to make it much more rigid, so it doesn't collapse on itself. And are those reinforcements now castings? Well, no, actually, the, inter the other interesting part probably about the tunnel is, and it's really where we put a lot of the, um, where all the extra stiffness comes from. Today's car, approximate numbers are, depending on how you count parts, 13 stampings in the tunnel. Now we have 11 stampings, nine extrusions, and four high pressure die casts. 
So what we call the tunnel structure, which is like the center tunnel plus the spider webs that reach out to the rail, you can see we doubled the part count. All, all based on computer simulation, knowing that that's where we want to put the mass and how to reinforce it locally. So that's going to give you the biggest payoff in stiffness. It, definitely the biggest payoff in stiffness is, this, is the center tunnel structure. I have to say, I've been in this business a long time, and every new car is 20% stiffer, 30% I know, I know. stiffer. And I, I believe that, but is there any maximum, or stiffer is always better? It's interesting, and it's interesting that we work very closely with, with Pratt and Miller and where their race cars are at, where their race cars are at. And um, it's, um, it's interesting because, like I said, we started saying we're going to be as good as C6, and that's a pretty good car. And it was three times stiffer than a C5 was three times stiffer than C4, C6, and C5 were very comparable. And we said we we're going to hold it. But once we got in the car, I think, you know, we, Jim Merrow and the ride and handling team and Tad felt we just weren't as stiff as we need to be. But it's always a balance. We could have made this 90% stiffer, but we, did not, we would not have got 99 pounds out of it. So it's really a balance between stiffness and mass. And it's always been what's good enough, but not too much. And, and really, I always, the other thing I always say is a convertible structure typically we found with this type of structure is really driven by the static stiffness requirement. So we engineer it heavily for the static stiffness, then we'll make sure we meet the durability and the crash readiness requirements. Rather than that crash readiness driver, we really let the static stiffness drive it. So it really is a mass balance. If you want stiffer, it's gonna have to be a little bit it's gonna have to be a little bit heavier. And so that's right and really Tadge and Jim Merrow and Dave Wickman, they get the you know, they ride the cars, they kind of feel where they want it and they set the targets and then we go after it. Brian Vaughn, I'm the interior design manager for the new Corvette. Ryan, uh, it's no secret that two of the biggest shortcomings of the C6 were the interior finish and the seat. Right. What did you do about the interior to make the C7 better? Well, honestly, we, when we approached the C7, we didn't approach it as fixing the C6. We really set out to design a brand new world-class sports car. So the interior is all new. Uh, the seats are all new based on a new structure. They're much stiffer, more aggressive than they have been in the past and there's actually two seats available now. So there's a GT seat, which is kind of a great all-around sports car seat, and then a competition seat, which is a very uh, aggressive, more hardcore track-oriented seat. And both of those seats, do they, in addition to maybe having more side support, are they just a stiffer structure? Because the, the C6 seats, it wasn't even just the lateral support, they were just floppy in some ways. Exactly, the stiffness is a huge part of it. So the, the contour of the bolsters is very important but the structure of the seat is, is just as important. So the, the frame, there's a magnesium frame in the seat itself and a hard shell back panel that allow the seats to be uh, very stiff. In the design of the uh, interior, did you guys have a particular concept or, or goal you wanted to get to? I think we, we knew we wanted, we wanted to be driver oriented, uh, very cockpit focused. Uh, we also knew we wanted to really uh, improve the materials um, so everything is cut and so wrapped, handcrafted, hand stitched, um, and very authentic. So if it looks like carbon fiber, it is carbon fiber. If it looks like aluminum, it really is aluminum. What did you do in the instrument cluster? Uh, Corvettes have had uh, pretty full instrumentation mm -hmm. and the option of picking uh, you know, what information you want to display. Uh, what have you done in that regard with the C7? Well, we actually incorporated an a, a eight inch high def reconfigurable screen into the center of the cluster. So there's uh, mechanical gators on either side, but the, the reconfigurable screen in the center really allows you to uh, tailor the information that the driver is being presented with to their personal taste. There's three different modes that you can use. There's a touring mode, a sport mode, and a track mode that is uh, actually based on this race car with more of a bar graph tack. Uh, very straightforward, very easy to read. Within each one of those modes, there's a lot of reconfigurability and customization that you can do to show various uh, vehicle functions, information, infotainment information, nav information as well. Does the car remember what modes you've picked so the next time you start it, it goes back to where you left it? Yes, it, it doesn't reset each time. Um, the, the cluster mode is all, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's also linked to uh, the vehicle mode. So there's a driver mode knob uh, selector in the car that changes numerous uh, vehicle functions from suspension, chassis, throttle response. And that's also linked to the cluster. So when you go from sport mode to track mode for the vehicle setting, you also go from sport mode to track mode in the instrument cluster. Is that vehicle mode knob, is that also customizable? So to some extent, maybe I want a soft ride, but I happen to like the track display and that's what exactly. I want to combine. You can do that. You can have it linked to the mode or you can unlink it. So if you want to be in uh, touring mode, uh, with the loud exhaust, you can do that. If you want it to be a uh, comfortable ride, but with the uh, race cluster, you can do that as well. 
what have you done with materials in order to uh, give this Corvette a much richer interior look? The materials were a very important part of this, uh, of this new interior. So uh, really every surface is either uh, an authentic material like leather or carbon fiber, or it's uh, cut and sew wrapped and soft. So there's a lot of hand stitching, um, a lot of really crafted surfaces. We wanted all the touch points in the car to be soft. So like in the driver's environment, where you'd have soft trim where the armrest is, and then as it goes forward, it kind of peels down into the leg area. So where your legs contact the car as you're bracing yourself against the car, that's also soft. What sort of optional interiors are you going to offer? You know, some of your competitors like Porsche offer just yeah, an unbelievable endless, amount yeah. of options. Uh, are you also going to offer uh, the ability to customize the interior of the car? Yeah, it's, it's very important that somebody who buys this car gets a car that's tailored for them and that's specific to what they wanted. So there's a lot of uh, color uh, availability and within there's, there's five different interior colors. Within each one of those colors, there's a lot of variation in how they are broken up uh, on the interior trim. So you can get a lot of different looks, um, very sporty, very serious, uh, and also very luxurious. So we've, we've really covered the whole spectrum. Are there mix and match possibilities between those kind of trim groups? Well, you can, uh, like, you know, we've got the two seats available, so you can mix and match seats. There's carbon fiber trim available, uh, which you can uh, mix and match with different trim levels. So there, there is that customization available. I mean, do you restrict it to some extent in that if there's some utterly tasteless combination, you won't allow it, or do you let the customer get what they want? There is a way to, uh, there, for a, a certain fee, I think Harlan knows more about it than I do, but um, there is a way to get a non-recommended combination, we call it. How about the uh, general dashboard? Is it higher or lower? What kind of uh, you know, interior ambiance is created in, in the new car? Yeah, the, the dashboard is actually uh, lower and slimmer than in the C6. Uh, so there's better sight lines. There's more of a, of a perception of, of space and of you know, the idea that this is really an efficiently packaged car, very uh, tightly wrapped. Uh, and um, um, yeah, the, it's really about the, the perception of spaciousness. The, the sections of the IP are not as uh, stood up. They're more laid back, more swept, more speedy. How about the uh, central LCD that controls the infotainment? I mean, this is obviously a sports car, but every car seems to have to have modern infotainment. What have you done in that regard? Well, it's the latest generation of the Chevy infotainment system, um, and it has a standard 8-inch touchscreen. But one of the important things with it was we wanted to make sure we had the right balance of touchscreen functionality and functionality in actual heart keys and buttons uh, on the instrument panel. So there are hard buttons and knobs um, there's a knob for volume, so you can go deep into the functionality screen if you want, but you also have that kind of blind reach capability where you just need to perform a function. It's very easy to reach for it and find it with the hard keys. By taking some of those radio controls and HVAC controls out of the touch screen, does that make it easier to program the touch screen because you have fewer functions to deal with? It does. It's all about finding that right balance between what's in the touch screen and what's left behind as, as actual hard interfaces. So anything that you adjust all the time, you really want it to have, for driver's uh, temperature, for example, you really want to have that be available uh, right away as a hard knob or button rather than deep in, in a menu. Um, but if you put the right functions in the screen, what's left behind on the, uh, on the instrument panel is clean and uncluttered. So it's really about getting that right balance. Corvettes have had tons of luggage room of late. Have you, was that a consideration in designing the interior to preserve that large luggage capacity? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we knew we had to maintain that capability that the car has to, uh, to carry enough bags for you know, a long journey or a day trip, weekend trip, that sort of thing. Um, and we have a uh, very similar luggage volume to today's car. Um, even uh, with the target top stowed in the back, there's enough space uh, for a, a, a roll-on bag.